afternoon and thank you for joining us here for our first noontime chat, which I understand is the first of a series. My name is Sarah McMenamin and I'm the Director of Early Childhood here at Germantown Friends. Let's start in the manner of friends with a moment of silence. In early childhood, we practice this regularly as we do throughout the school. And the way we best do it in early childhood is to breathe in peace and breathe out love. So I invite you to take three deep breaths with me and then take a pause to center ourselves. I breathe in peace. I breathe out love. I breathe in peace. I breathe out love. I breathe in peace. I breathe out love. Our moment of silence begins. Thank you again for joining us today. I will keep my remarks short so that we can get to the meat of the presentation. Just want to let you know that early childhood is the first division, and we like to say, of the school, with lower school, middle school, and upper school being the other three. Early childhood is comprised of the youngest learners, so kids who are two years, seven months at the start of the school year, uh, which we call younger preschool. Uh, we have a class of three and four-year-olds we call the older preschool, and then we have pre-K, which is the year before kindergarten comprised of the fours turning five. We have two campuses. One is the main campus with which many of you are familiar and many of you might or might not be familiar with our second Center City campus just for early childhood students on Washington Square. Each campus has four classrooms and we would love to spend more time talking about our programming, but that's the talk of another day. I will direct you to the admissions office for that. Uh, today we're here to talk about young children and how we can talk to them about race and racism. This is a uh, workshop that the teachers came to me asking to put together um, a few weeks back uh, when we were seeing a lot of protests and kids were asking a lot of questions and it seemed like the time was right to help support our families in ways to have open, candid conversations. So I'm going to ask um, for a little poll to be taken. Um, it's a quick question that is just about whether you've ever had a talk with your child about race. And I invite you to take a minute to respond and then we'll move on with our presentation. All right, it looks like we've got 100% of respondents. So um, we're gonna, we'll talk about this later. Um, but let's move on and let me introduce to you our director, what we call the DEI director, um, diversity, equity and inclusion, Dr. Angela Campbell will speak to us a little bit now before moving into the teachers chatting. Angela. Thank you, Sarah. Um, it's wonderful to be here with all of you and uh, my wonderful, amazing colleagues. Thank you for bringing me onto the program today. Um, this is the most important topic, and our Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion is equally committed to our students' understanding of who they are in the world and the education that is necessary to build a strong sense of self that can carry them throughout their lifetimes. And certainly early childhood is perfectly positioned to lay that necessary foundation in the work. And so in early childhood, there is a diversity committee and um, we, have a, uh, we have a clerk of the Early Childhood Diversity Committee uh, and she, as, long, as, as well as I, 
uh, lead that diversity committee. And the purpose of every diversity committee at GFS is to bring faculty and staff together to think about um, how we do our work in terms of pedagogy and curriculum and um, what kind of professional development does faculty and, and staff need to carry out our aims in creating an inclusive, equitable, safe, and loving environment at GFS. And so in that work, um, we have our, our very own faculty members in early childhood who are solely committed to putting their hearts and minds and thinking about how we honor the light in each of our children and each of our students, especially the youngest of our GFS members. Um, and so the office is organized. We have Associate Director Andrew Lee. We have the four diversity committees. Um, we also have um, connections and partnerships with other areas um, at the institution in order to think about inclusion robustly and authentically so that we can be aligned with our strategic vision of lighting the way. Um, this is a most important conversation. Um, this will continue and I'm sure you'll have thoughts and questions about the urgency of now um, to do this work and to do it right so that we bring forth a generation of young people who will significantly transform our world into a much better one. Thank you so much. Thank you, Angela. Thank you for letting our um, group know who you are and what we do. Um, my name is Lindsay Roberts. I have the, I am a teacher in the older preschool class. And I sort of have a different perspective because I'm also a parent. My daughter Simone will be rising into pre-K next year. And as also a teacher, it's really important that we begin these conversations as early as possible. That way we can have children that understand differences, that know that we aren't, we are not, we're different, but the same. Um, I am sure that, I'm not sure, but possibly many of you have heard about what is going on um, over social media with Germantown Friends. And it was important to our DEI committee to be transparent about that, to be open about a conversation and let you know that we are here for our children. And so I wrote a statement that I'd like to share with you. I'd like to address that there has been a lot of conversation on social media regarding black students experiences at GFS. We are deeply saddened by these stories and wanna assure you that early childhood has been committed to fair and equitable treatment to our students and families. As educators, especially um, of young children, we have the unique opportunity to shape not only the way our children learn how to talk about important issues, but to model the world we wish for them to thrive in. I think you will learn from the presentation today the value that we place on each of our children at GFS. I think at the end of this conversation, we are hopeful that our early childhood team will have provided you with enough information so that you are as excited about joining our school as we are to have you. It can be hard to start these conversations with young children, but we do it regularly and as a part of our curriculum. And the goal of this webinar is to help you do the same at home. We hope you leave today with some tools to support little people with big voices mm -hmm. for change. Thank you for listening. And I am going to introduce my co-teacher, Jenny Taylor. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, my name is Jenny Taylor. I have been teaching in the early childhood division for over 30 years. Um, 10 of those I have spent with Lindsay co-teaching together. Um, and I would like to echo what Lindsay said that um, and the early child division takes this work very serious, 
passionately and we are very passionate about it and always have been. Um, I'm going to reflect on the, um, the results of the poll that we saw. It looked like most of you have already started a conversation about race with your children. It's very impressive. And let's remember that it's an ongoing thing. And if you haven't, it's never too late to start, right? So thank you for participating in that poll. Um, I'm going to uh, speak about the anti-bias, anti-racism curriculum. Uh, it's a framework that can be put into use throughout school, up to 12th grade. The, uh, it just looks different. Um, the basic framework has four parts. The first being identity. Each child will de demonstrate self-awareness, confidence, family pride, and positive social identities. And also we want to point out that we want children to have self, we want to build self-esteem, but we also want to do that without them devaluating other people. That's an important part of your identity. Diversity, each child expresses comfort and joy with human diversity, the accurate language for human differences and deep caring connections. We want our children to have a cultural, begin to have a cultural competency, how to um, act in a diverse world, how to respond to the world around you. We want them to be curious and open-minded about the experiences of others and to engage respectfully with others and to build <clears throat> empathy and connection with others. Justice, each child increasingly recognizes unfairness, has the language to describe unfairness and understand that unfairness hurts. We want our children to recognize stereotypes. We've all heard it, you know, um, girls can't play with trucks, for example. Um, we want our children to be change makers and respond to instances like that by taking action. So it's, um, it's more than teaching kindness. It's um, teaching our children how to respond to incidences of injustice and unfairness, um, to take responsibility as a citizen, to stand up and speak out. I'm going to pass the baton to Michael. Are we going to do another poll? I'm not sure if this is the time. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you, my, Jenny. Sure. Um, my name is Michael Roach. I teach in the younger preschool classroom on main campus. And you're seeing up on the screen right now a poll that's just asking you how old are the children that are in your care? Where are we at? And we'll just take a moment for this. And this will give us a sense, we'll see, we'll see the answers in a moment, and this will give us a sense of really the population that you're dealing with and how we can best help you. So it looks like we have some one to three year olds, a lot of three to five year olds, and some post five year olds. So it looks like we've got a pretty good, um, pretty good mix here. Right, so I'm going to be speaking to you about what racial identity development looks like as children continue to grow. And this identity development really starts from the time that they are born. Um, you know, they're born and they are able to interact and see the caretakers and the people that they're engaging with. So by six months old, um, babies are able to notice and they're able to respond to skin color and they're often looking at the faces and they're, um, they feel more comfortable looking at faces that match that of their caregivers. By two years old, the children may match people based on those physical characteristics. They may begin to match what they think families should look like or who belongs in a family based on those physical characteristics. Um, they may begin to feel discomfort or they may begin to feel a sense of fear around unfamiliar people 
or people who don't look like what they are used to engaging with. And so by two years old, this gives us a sense that we really need to think about how diverse the circles are around these children and who they're engaging with, who you're engaging with and your family is engaging with. By three, four years old, children are often overgeneralizing the, uh, the information that they believe is true. And if you know a three-year-old, you know that they will tell you um, what they believe the truth is. Sometimes they're painting with, with a little bit of a wide brush here, um, but they are making, these, uh, they're making this information based off of the experiences and based off of what they're experiencing around them. So they're absorbing cues from the people around them. They're taking cues in from the media and they're beginning to understand and recognize what begins to be a stereotype. Now, by three or four years old, they are also beginning to develop a really deep sense of justice and what is right, wrong, fair, and unfair. So that three years old um, point is when we really begin to talk to our friends at GFS about fairness and unfairness. And that's how we begin to have these conversations in our classroom. And now we're gonna move on to five, years, uh, five year olds. So if we can move to the next slide. So by five or six years old, children are beginning to um, deepen their awareness of their own personal identity, what it means to be from one race compared to another. And these, uh, these experiences it may conflict with them entering school. Um, some of the messages that they've experienced so far may come into conflict with what they're seeing or uh, experiencing in school. Because oftentimes school is one of the first larger institutions that children enter into. And as we know, larger institutions often have a lot of issues going on. Um, so the messages from five to six years old, those messages of stereotypes and other generalizations begin to affect the, child, uh, the child's sense of group worth and self-identity. By six, seven, eight, nine years old, children begin to develop um, a deeper sense of what racism in, is or the biases that they've experienced. They're able to understand the scientific reasoning for skin color and how geography has um, affected that. Around six, seven, eight, nine, no surprise, name calling increases. And so based on the information that they're collecting, they might start insulting other children. Um, but they are also able to articulate their truth and their experiences more. They're able to develop more um, defined language for how to communicate what they've experienced and what they've been taught. By 10 to 12 years old, many of the attitudes and beliefs that they've um, started to develop around race and around identity have solidified. They become concrete. So by 10 to 12, what they believe about race has solidified. That means that from 12 years old on, it becomes the work of the people around them to begin to untangle that, to begin to change what, they, uh, what they've been told and to alter their beliefs. And we know that from 12 years old on, it is so much harder to do. It is so much harder to untangle that and to take, take that apart. So that's why it is so important within the first 10 years of their life to be having these conversations regularly around race, around the people that they are experiencing, around the people that are regularly surrounding them. Because by 12 years old, 
it can be too late. So now I'm gonna pass um, the proverbial mic over to Rachel, my co-teacher, who's gonna talk to you about having these conversations in your house. Rachel, before you um, begin, I just wanted to um, tell our guests that if you have any questions during our presentation, um, please email them to communications at germantownfriends.org and we can hopefully answer some of your questions live. So um, if you can do that as soon as possible, that would be great. Thank you. And um, you can go, Rachel. Thank you. I'm sorry. No, thank you, Lindsay, for that. And thank you, Michael. Um, so my name is Rachel Green. Um, as Michael said, we are co-teachers. So I'm a younger preschool classroom teacher at Maine campus. Um, and we, I'm going to start out again with another poll. So this poll is how comfortable are you talking about race? I think we have different, very comfortable, moderately comfortable, not comfortable. And we'll get the results from that. Okay, so it looks like we have about 38% that feels very comfortable. Um, some about the rest, 63% about moderately comfortable and 0% not comfortable. So I feel like we're at a really good starting place here. Um, so today we're going to be kind of giving you some tips and maybe some steps that could hope help you, guide you, maybe take those conversations to the next level um, with your little ones at home. So the first thing, and this is something that we try to practice and we've been practicing a lot, um, especially this year with a lot of different unknowns, is sit with your own feelings first. Um, there's a lot to be taken in, even from what Michael has already delivered and Jenny and Angela, it's a lot. So even coming from here, you wanna just sit with how you're feeling first. You don't want to rush. Yes, it's a sense of urgency, but you also wanna take that time for yourself too before having these conversations. The next thing is trying to get a sense of what your child knows. We don't just want to assume um, because, as we know, children sometimes soak in more than what we know or maybe are not even paying attention. You really just want to know before you have those conversations what the, where their minds are. Next slide. And a good suggestion for doing that is by providing some guiding questions or prompts. As teachers, this is kind of something we're doing all the time. We're trying to assess what children already know before we teach it to them. So it's the same kind of concept. So you kind of just want to see where their minds are. So some of those um, guiding questions or prompts could be, what do you notice? What do you wonder? What do you think? And this could be used as you're reading high quality, diverse literature, as you're reading a story. It could be as they're playing or maybe just even observing something on the news. These are some good questions. It's just kind of get their mind thinking without you kind of saying things first. Um, the next thing is to keep it simple. Um, you want to keep it developmentally appropriate. As Michael pointed out, children develop in certain phases. So you want to make sure that these conversations are appropriate for them. Because we know sometimes even the question that they may be giving looks so big, but once you get to the core of it, it was something so simple. So these conversations will evolve as your child grows. Next slide. It's okay if you don't have all the answers. And I think that's kind of the reassuring thing. That's part of the reason why we're here today. Um, to just even try to provide a little bit more answers. Um, and also sometimes it's even okay to tell your child that if there's a question that they have, I don't have the answer, or it might not even be an answer for that question yet. And it's okay to then explore that more with them. And that gives you time to even do your own research to then present something back. So it's okay if you don't have the answers. Um, and also this is a marathon, not a sprint. So we know we can't get all this work done right now. This is something that is going to have to keep on going. And that's something that we want to incorporate into our lifestyle. So this becomes an everyday thing. And next, I am going to introduce one of my fellow EC teachers, Bianca. Thank you, Rachel, for that. Uh, my name is Bianca Desimore. 
I am a young preschool teacher on main campus. I teach alongside Michael and Rachel, and I'm going to be sharing some more tips about how you can have conversations about race and racism with your child at home. Um, the first thing to remember is that it's really important, this was echoed by Rachel, Rachel to follow your child's, child's lead. Mm -hmm. um, they wanna feel safe and supported in asking questions about what they notice. So it is important to go at their pace and to provide a space for them to process and express their emotions. They may not wanna talk or may not have any questions and that's okay. You need to be patient and okay with closing the conversation for now because they're still processing and thinking about it. It's an ongoing process and the conversation doesn't stop. And so you need to be ready to have these talks regularly. There's no one right way to have these conversations. The conversation may look different and it's going to manifest itself at different times. And so it's also important to remember that children's process things that they experience through play, it really helps them get a sense and make sense of the world around them. And through this play, questions may come up and that's a great way to engage them and foster these conversations. And now I'm gonna pass it on to our school librarian, Catherine. Thanks, Bianca. Um, so my name is Catherine Murphy and I am the librarian for the Early Childhood Division. And I'm here to talk to you about books and um, the importance, especially right now, of children's literature. And then also some resources that our teachers and our community have put together to help navigate um, these conversations. Books are a powerful tool for starting conversations and opening our children up to the beautiful and diverse world around us. I wanna invite you just for a moment to reflect on the books that you read with your child. Do the words and pictures represent diverse voices, identities such as race and gender, diverse abilities and family structures? Because when we deliberately and continuously choose to share diverse stories and voices, we're not only planting seeds of kindness, compassion, empathy and curiosity, which is great, but we are telling our children and we're showing to our children that it matters and this is very important to us. And that we're also nurturing light in our children to be change makers. So the books on the screen right now that you're seeing, um, it's important that we understand that books can be windows or sliding glass doors into other people's worlds or other people's experiences, but they can also be mirrors that reflect children and their experiences so they feel seen and valued and honored. And so these books right here are so beautiful. They're not just about, they're not about race. They are just beautiful stories featuring children of color. So we can move to the next slide. And then we also need to share stories that celebrate our children of color and affirm their innate love, beauty, light, and creativity in our world. And looking at, if you just look at these cover images, you can just see the joy and pride coming off of the page. Um, so Magnificent Homespun Brown is a pretty new title. And um, as you can see, it's a celebration of feeling um, wonderful in one's own skin. And then Mixed Me is a book about Mike, a racially mixed child who's confident in his own skin. And his, there's a quote from the book, mom and dad say, I'm a blend of light and dark. We mixed you perfectly. We got you just right. So you can move to the next slide. And then we, it's critical that we share stories that um, show individuals, people using their voices to make change in the world and to encourage and empower our children to use their own voices and stories so that they can stand up and speak out against injustice and be change makers in this world. So the first book that you're seeing, and these are just, these are just, examples. There's so many out there, but Say Something by Peter Reynolds. He really 
writes books from the heart. Um, and this is about um, using your voice. The world needs your voice. If you have a brilliant idea, say something. If you see an injustice, say something. So Peter Reynolds is encouraging our children and ourselves to use our actions, our words, our art, and our voices to make change. And then Anti-Racist Baby is Ibram Kendi's newest book, first book for children, just came out. And um, this is really a great book to start a conversation. He wrote it. He has a young child. He wrote it to have a book to read with his child. And um, it's just beautiful. <laughs> um, and again, like I said, this is a great book for the youngest learners. So we can, we can start the conversation as early as possible. That, so that anti-racism is a, is a vocab, is vocabulary in our home that is, that we're talking about regularly and that it's um, not taboo. Um, or race is not taboo. And then you can move to the next slide. So in response to all of the articles and videos and podcasts and book lists that have been shared through our community, um, we created a, a resource page that lives on our online library catalog page, which is that first link below the image. And it's called Black Lives Matter, period. And you'll see this, the image that you see is books for young children. And then you can see at the top, there's different tabs that you can scroll through. Um, there's early childhood resources, resources as well that have articles listed, book lists, podcasts, resources that um, bring you to organizations that will help you navigate these conversations. And um, if you, if you um, visit our website or our catalog, you'll also see book lists that, um, that highlight social justice titles and LGBTQ titles. Um, so we hope you explore these resources that we have for you and share them. We are, the Friends Free Library is a library for the GFS community, but we're very unique in that we also serve our German, wider Germantown community and beyond. So we are at a, we're a very special, unique place at an intersection. Um, and we hope you come visit us when we open back up. And um, thank you for being here with us today. So I believe we have one question. Um, could we share that? So here is our question. My efforts to discuss race with my three-year-old have been counterproductive. I seem to be introducing the exact opposite ideas I intend. I mention ways of color, I mention ways people of color are unfairly stereotyped or feared and the way it affects their lives. And my three-year-old's take away is that people of color must be different and people are scared of them. I've been hesitant to continue discussing racial issues until I know how to do it in a way that won't be damaging. Is it okay to focus on exposure to diverse people and stories at her age and leave the complexity of racism for when she's older? Or should I keep trying to communicate how people of color are treated unjustly? I think that's a really good question. I think that you should keep trying. Um, we've given some great book ideas and I think that having conversations while reading books. I'm not sure if that is a place where, if you've started or used that, but I feel like when we're in our classrooms, that that's usually how we start our conversations. We give a book and have an example of what we're going to start talking about. And that gives us an open range to start the conversation. We do maybe give time, a little moment of silence to think about it. And um, I think that, you know, and some three-year-olds also develop differently, right? So if you keep at it and keep finding ways to, to expose your child and yourself and that it, it'll become a little bit easier. Um, because racism, yes, is a very complex uh, 
topic to talk to a young child about. And we want to be at their level. So I think the little, just the little bits, the little um, baby steps, like I like to say, is, is a good way to start. And I would start with books. Um, I hope that that answers your question. Can I jump in, Linz? Yeah, please do. Um, I just want to uh, jump off of what Lindsay's saying and, and think about um, since part of it is worrying that your three-year-old might think black people are different, back to that book part, look for books where just black children or children of, of other backgrounds in any way, shape, or form are just living their lives so that you make it routine and normal to see people that look different from your child doing all the same kinds of things your family does. To start um, integrating that idea of normalcy. And then as your child gets a little bit older, you can, um, and their brain develops in a different way and they start noticing things that are unfair to them, then you can broaden it and start talking about how things are unfair for people in the world too. How black people have um, suffered for 400 plus years and, and go into those things. But right now you just kind of have to normalize race and people looking different, but being all this, doing all the same things. In other words, everybody has a family, everybody goes to school, all those same things so that your child doesn't think that people who look different are living in, in a different way and should be frightening. Um, if I could also just jump in I want to lift up what I think Jenny has brought up in the past as well, where you can also, in the, the beginning stages of these conversations, you can provide an anchor by saying, in our family, we believe that it's okay if everybody looks a little bit different. And, it's a, and in our family, we believe that everybody should be treated fairly, even if you're a little bit different than um, someone else. And just giving those, those sort of frameworks for the conversation will also help provide a framework for the child um, in how they're thinking about this. I don't think we have any more questions at the moment. I'm sorry our Q&A box wasn't working today. Um, but do feel free to follow up. And I'm going to now introduce Laura Myron, who is Director of Enrollment Management. Laura, are you here? I am. Hi. Thank you so much, Sarah. Again, my name is Laura Sharpless Myron. I'm Director of Enrollment. And I'd like to thank Bianca and Sarah, Dr. Campbell, Jenny Taylor, Rachel Green, Michael Roach, Lindsay Roberts, and Catherine Murphy, as well as the Early Childhood Diversity Committee for putting together this panel and also for your ongoing work in um, all the areas that you are so well versed in, including this very important topic for our very youngest learners. Um, I want to say that this is an important topic for all learners of every age, for all people. And uh, we know, and I think that everybody pretty much can agree, or we hope for people who will agree that the more eclectic and diverse our school is, the better the education the more profound and rich it will be, and the more powerful, therefore, for the leaders of tomorrow. So thanks to, again to everyone, um, and thanks to all of us, all of the attendees who were willing to take this opportunity for a lunchtime chat today. And if you have any questions at all for members of our panel, for us in admissions, uh, my team is ready to assist you if you're interested in applying or have more questions about German Tom Friends in general or this topic. Um, we would love to help you and take those questions and get back to you. You can email at germantomfriends.org slash admissions 
and we will point your question to those who can get back to you if it's not admissions folks. So um, I think that's all. Does anyone have anything to add before we close? We do our hearts. Do so, our yeah. So mm -hmm. in early childhood, um, as we have been working through remote learning, one of our students decided to show us how to say goodbye. Usually um, when we end moments of silence, we're shaking hands. And during this time, we can't really shake hands. Oh wait, are we done? No. <laughs> Keep going. Um, we don't, um, we can't shake hands. So we have started putting our hands in a heart form and then we explode our hearts with love <laughs> and send it to everyone. So if you can put your hands and hearts up and send love to each other, that's how we're saying goodbye. So thank you for joining us. Um, we had a really nice time with you um, talking about these really hard issues. So thanks again and 